Now, this is a talk for PyCon, which is over a month from now. So this is still very much in flux. If you have feedback, I am very happy to hear it. Now, with that said, why are we here? We're here because we love Python, right? Yeah. I'm not feeling it. We're here because we love Python, right? Okay. And why do we love Python? We love Python because it really emphasizes a sort of key insight about programming, which is you read code much more often than you write it. So code should be made as readable as possible, which is why Python, you know, for example, this very typical Python function is so eminently clear and readable and easy to understand. Calculates Fibonacci numbers. So this is a talk about bytecode. Uh, which is how Python actually executes your code, at least the C Python implementation that you get from python.org. Other Python implementations can do different things. We're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about, number one, what is bytecode? How does Python use it? Number two, we're going to take a look at how can I see bytecode? How can I sort of decipher it and understand what's going on? Talk about the execution model. And finally, we're going to look at some examples of actual Python code and how it turns into bytecode and see the differences that even some small changes in your source code can make to performance and what's going on in the bytecode. So first, we're going to talk about how Python works. We've got to understand how a computer works, which means I get to show you one of my favorite tweets of all time. So we're going to talk a little bit about how computers work and how programming languages work. And if anybody wants to pop open a Python interpreter on a laptop and type in this function here, uh, this is the Fibonacci function that generated that first slide. Uh, you can play along on the next couple slides with some things I'm gonna show you. <clears throat> we do need to understand, how does a computer work? Well, a CPU is basically a wafer of silicon with a bunch of electrical circuits on it. And we set it up so that we send in certain patterns of electricity and other patterns of electricity come out. And we assign meanings to those patterns of electricity. We call them instructions. We say, oh, well, this pattern of electricity represents arithmetic, and this pattern represents this logical operation. But we very rarely actually write the instructions for the CPU. It's kind of tedious. And thankfully, you know, back in the 50s, Grace Hopper invented the compiler for us, which let us turn our source code that humans can read into the actual instructions for our CPU of choice. My sound just cut out. Can you all hear me? Okay, I'm just gonna yell real loud. Okay, so one of the ways we can do a programming language is we can have a compiler. We can run it over our source code, turn it into instructions for our CPU, and then we can just run those instructions directly. Another approach is we can have a program called an interpreter that just takes our source code and runs it directly, translating it as it's running into instructions for our CPU. But there's a sort of in-between best of both model that we can take, which is what Python does, what Java does, what C Sharp does, what a lot of languages do, which is to compile our source code into instructions, but not for the CPU we're gonna run on. In fact, not for any physical CPU that exists, instead, it's a completely virtual software implemented CPU. We're gonna call that a virtual machine. And we're gonna call those instructions bytecode. And this is what Python does. It will compile your source code into bytecode, then execute it. And if you've ever seen one of these .pyc files, raise your hand if you've seen one of those. Everybody in here has seen one of those. You see them in Python 2, they show up in the same directory as your source code when you run your program or you import it. Python 3, there's a double under PyCache directory that it creates, stores them in. This is a nice little optimization. Python can store that compiled bytecode so it doesn't have to recompile your program every single time you run it. Uh, it only recompiles if you change it. So now how can we figure out what's going on with this bytecode? Well, we can inspect some things. If anybody decided to type in that Fibonacci function while I was talking, there's this attribute that'll be on it. You can access double under code and it's what's called a code object. And this contains all the things Python needs to know in order to execute your function. And there's some attributes on this that are kind of useful to understanding what's going on in the bytecode. First one I want to talk about here is an attribute on this code object called coconsts. This is a tuple. 
It contains all of your constants, literals, that you used in the body of your function. You can see there my Fibonacci function used an integer 2, integer 0, integer 1, used a tuple with 0 and 1 in it. There's also a none in here. Does anybody who's not Barry want to guess why the none is in there, even though the body of the function doesn't use it? And every function Yes, every function has an implicit return none. And when Python's compiling this to bytecode, it can see there are explicit return statements. But I think there's there's some recent theorem I've heard about this is you can't actually predict in advance whether you're going to hit one of those. Um, some some kind of you know crazy CS thing. You, you may have heard of it. Uh, so Python has to set this up, and we have to make sure we have that none available because we may need to do an implicit return none if we never hit one of those explicit return statements. That's in there. There's another attribute on here called co var names. This is a tuple that contains all the names of variables that are referenced in the body of the function, local variables to the function. So we have that argument, n, we have variables current, next, and counter that were used inside that function. Uh, there's another one called co names. Fibonacci function didn't use any of these. This is where you're going to find any non-local names or things that need to be referenced inside the body of that function. And then finally, we get to the good stuff. Co code. This is Python bytecode. This is not a string. Some of the characters in it are ASCII printable, but this is a bytes object and it is interpreted as bytes. This is the actual bytecode that Python's going to execute when it runs this function. So suppose we want to understand what's going on in this bytecode. We can look at this first byte. It printed as a pipe character, so we don't actually know the decimal value. We can ask Python, what's the decimal value of a pipe as a byte? It's 124. Now, that means this is opcode, instruction, whatever you want to call it, number 124. Well, what is that? Turns out we can ask Python. There's this module in the standard library called dis. It's the Python disassembler. It will help you figure out lots of things about bytecode. And we can ask it through this list that it maintains of op names. What is bytecode instruction number 124? Turns out it's called load fast. And if anybody was really paying attention on that first slide, you may remember the very first line of disassembled bytecode of that Fibonacci function was an instruction load fast. The second byte was a zero, which is the argument to the load fast instruction. And what that's going to do is index into that uh, CO var names tuple, which remember we saw is all our local variables. The first item in there was the variable n, which is our function argument that we took. So this is saying, take whatever value we had for that local variable, push it onto the stack. Now we've got to talk about the stack a little bit. We're actually going to talk about multiple stacks. There's three different stacks we've got to care about for this. First of all, is everybody familiar with the idea of a Python call stack? Or at least a call stack as a way of implementing a language. Uh, this is basically every function call gets its own object on this stack. The stack is just a data structure. You can push things on top of it, pop things off. Think of it like you know the stack of dishes in a cafeteria. And every function call is going to generate what's called a frame on that stack. And in that frame, Python is going to execute your function. And that frame has its own stack associated with it, which is what's going to be storing the data and things that this function is going to use. We're going to push the value of this local variable n onto the top of the stack. If you want to see all of the bytecode for this function, you can just type in dis.dis, .dis, disassemble this. It'll print it in a nice human-readable format. So now what is actually going on here? Suppose we want to call that Fibonacci function. Let's say we want the eighth Fibonacci number. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to type fib8. That's going to turn into three bytecode instructions. And so we're going to start doing this. Our stack is empty right now. First instruction we're going to get to called load global, it's going to load the Fibonacci function. In this case, it's the first item in a tuple. So it's going to get pushed on top of the stack. Then we're going to hit our next instruction, load const, which is going to hit one of those CO const tuples. This is the second item in our CO const tuples. What's the first item? None, right, you're paying attention, good. So we're going to push that integer eight on top of the stack. And then we're going to get to this instruction, call function. And suddenly the stack looks very different afterwards. What this is going to do, its argument is integer 1. You remember what our stack looked like there? The way Python calls a function with positional arguments is push the function onto the stack, 
then push each positional argument onto the stack, then execute the call function instruction with an argument that lists the number of positional arguments. It's gonna pop those off the stack. The next thing on top is gonna to be the function, pop that off. We're gonna push a new stack on, or push a new frame onto our Python call stack, execute the bytecode of the Fibonacci function, which we've already seen in that frame. Whatever value it returns comes back, gets pushed onto the top of the stack. That's how we call a function. There are actually three ways of calling a function in Python because, you know, there should be one and only one way to do it, right? Uh, so call function is for calling a function with only positional arguments. There's one called call function kw, which is for a function that involves keyword arguments. It pushes instead of just the positional arguments, pushes the positional arguments, then the values of the keyword arguments, then a tuple containing the names of the keyword arguments, pops them all off the stack and executes it. There's also a relatively new one, brand new in Python 3.6, called EX. Uh, this is if you are using the unpacking syntax in your call. Uh, so if you have like a list that you had some positional arguments in or a dictionary with some keyword arguments in it, and you use the asterisk syntax to unpack those, you get that call function EX instruction is how that gets called. So I've mentioned the call stack. And I've shown you the stack here. I said there were three stacks. So amongst our many stacks are evaluation stack, or sometimes called a data stack. This is the one we've been looking at. The call stack, which is where Python is doing all its work. And a third one called a block stack. And this one is important to know about. The block stack is where anytime you enter a loop, anytime you enter a try except, anytime you enter a with block, anything like that, it's gonna push onto the block stack because Python needs to know how many of those are active and which one is the one we're currently in. For example, we might run into a break statement or a continue statement, and we need to know exactly where we're going back to when we do that. So that's why we keep this stack of blocks. And each frame on our call stack has one of each type of these stacks associated with it, one evaluation stack local to it, and one block stack local to it. Now, if you wanna play around with this, uh, you can dive into the dis module. There's this dis.dis .dis function, which does the disassembly, nice human readable, really handy. Uh, if you want to, you can pass it a file object or a file-like object. It will write out the disassembled bytecode to that object for you. Uh, there's another function called dis.tb, which is really kind of cool. I'm gonna show you an example of that in just a moment. There's also a class called bytecode. You can pass any of these, a you know, actual callable or a module or a code object or a string just containing some source code. The bytecode object returns you an instance of bytecode, which is iterable and yields up tuples representing the bytecode instructions. And each one has a bunch of useful attributes on it to tell you what's going on. Now this dis.tb function, I really love. This is useful for debugging. Sometimes you have an exception happen in your code and you're not really sure what's going on. Uh, here, for example, I've caused a zero division error. And then I import dis called dis.tb. You can pass it a traceback object, or if you don't have one handy, it can just grab whichever one just happened for you. It'll disassemble whatever function was at the top of the Python call stack when the exception happened, show you that bytecode, and put a handy little pointer to whatever instruction was being executed when that exception got raised. This can be a useful thing to figure out, wait, what exactly happened? Where did my code go wrong? Now, if you wanna learn more about all of the different bytecode instructions, what they are, what they do, uh, you can go look up the documentation for the dis module. Pretty well written, it has a nice list of all of the uh, instructions, opcodes, what they do, what arguments they take. Uh, it can be a little weird when you're sort of figuring out how this works. Is anybody here programmed in fourth or anything similar to fourth? Uh, okay, you're the weird ones who are gonna get it right away. <laughs> Everybody else, you might have to think about it a bit because a stack-based way of programming is sort of different from what we're used to. Most of these opcodes are involved in pushing things onto the stack, popping things off the stack, copying what's on top of the stack, rotating things that are on top of the stack. It can be a weird way to think. But once you sort of get the hang of it and just practice, write some functions and see what bytecode they produce, it starts to make sense. But I do wanna talk about specific code and specific examples of things. So I'm gonna show you a couple functions. These each do exactly the same thing. They calculate the number of seconds in a week. 
And I want you to guess, I've cleverly hidden which one of them is slow and which one of them is fast. Which one do you think is the slow one? And why do you think it's the slow one? Getting close. It does have to look up the seconds per day, but there's more to it than that. Let's look at the bytecode for these two functions. The bytecode for the fast one is really interesting. It doesn't push anything onto the stack except one value, and it doesn't do any multiplication. When Python compiled this to bytecode, it noticed I was doing multiplication with two integer constants. They're not going to change. The result of that is perfectly static, and it optimized away that multiplication when it was compiling to bytecode. You can learn some fun things about the way the Python interpreter works by just looking at bytecode. Uh, you can also answer a lot of common questions. There are a ton of closed duplicates on Stack Overflow asking, why is it faster to use a literal list syntax than to call the list function built in? Why is it faster to use a literal dict than it is to call the dict built in? Well, you can ask the dis module to disassemble these for you, and it will show you exactly what's going on. Calling the dict function involves multiple operations. One of them is a function call, so we have to push something onto the call stack, execute a function, and return it. Whereas, if you just use the literal syntax, it's this one operation. If you actually want to put something in the dictionary, it's more operations than that. You have to push some things onto the stack and then build map with them. But it's still usually going to be faster. So what about some other examples? Um, unfortunately, examples for showing off bytecode tend to be kind of contrived. I don't have anything super interesting here. We're just going to look at a function that calculates uh, perfect squares 0 through 10. Uh, so square each one of them and return them. Here's one way we could do this. We could do this little while loop and just loop through till we get to 10, append squares. This isn't the whole function. This is just the body of the loop. And this body of the loop is 15 bytecode instructions. Uh, you can tell it's the loop, by the way, because of those brackets. Anytime there's a jump target, so a loop or a place that an if else is going to go, the disassembler will print those handy little brackets for you to show you what's going on. You can tell where these boundaries are of your jumps and your loops. So this is 15 instructions. Can we do better than that? Is there, is there a more obvious Pythonic way to write this? Maybe we could use the range built in at a for loop. Well, that gets us to nine instructions. That saved us six instructions. That's like a 40% savings on instructions by using range at a for loop instead of a while loop. As it turns out, that saved us a bunch of work under the hood. That's kind of cool. Can we do better? What's a better way? A list comprehension. Hmm, I wonder what a list comprehension looks like. This time the whole function, not just the loop, the whole function is nine instructions. But what's the trap here? There's something hidden going on here. You'll notice there's this opcode make function and another opcode call function. We're building and calling a function as part of doing this list comprehension. So we're actually going to have to push something onto the stack, uh, onto the call stack, execute it, pop it right back off the call stack, return a value. This is still actually pretty fast. In fact, the uh, body of the function that's generated from that list comprehension is only nine instructions. You can look at it if you want to. You could write this function out in a Python interpreter access that double under code on it, and you'll notice this compiled code object that was generated by the list comprehension is a constant that got attached to it. So you can look in its CO consts, you'll see a code object there, you can start inspecting its bytecode. Bytecode all the way down, mostly, sort of. Um, so you can look at that and you can see it's nine instructions in that function, nine instructions in this function, it's 18 instructions altogether. Uh, the for loop with the range built in is actually 20 instructions for the full uh, body of the function. Only involves one function called a range, whereas this one involves two. So maybe you're going to save some time, maybe you're not. It really depends entirely on what you're doing in that list comprehension versus what you were doing in the non-comprehension version. But it's good to know you're not always saving by shaving off bytecode instructions. Because some of them are more expensive than others. Making a function and calling a function are relatively expensive bytecode instructions. Whereas just looping through things can often be a lot faster. So don't be misled by just seeing which version of my function has the fewest bytecode instructions. So it's not always guaranteed to be the fastest. So 
at about 20 minutes right now, I think, we've got about five minutes to go. I want to go over just sort of four things that I want you to remember about bytecode and looking at it. And people always want to look at it as a way to optimize performance and a way to think about how can I make my code faster. And I want to mention a couple things about that. The first thing is it almost never matters. <laughs> if you're looking at Python bytecode for optimization purposes, either you've done really well everywhere else in your stack or you're looking at the wrong place. Your best speed ups are going to come from writing code in C or using built ins from Python that are implemented in C that don't have to go through all the hassle of using bytecode and using the bytecode VM to execute or using an alternative uh, implementation like PyPy, if you can run on that and get the benefits of all that JIT compilation and runtime profiling. But just keep this in mind, anytime you're trying to optimize, Python is always slower than C. Anytime you can offload work into C, and you can do a lot of that in Python. Uh, anytime you can offload work into C, you're gonna get benefits. Uh, second thing, how many of you have ever read a Python performance tutorial uh, that told you to, uh, anytime you want to reference a global or something from outside your function, alias it inside the function. Assign it to a variable inside that function body because it's faster. This is technically true. Uh, there are four ways in bytecode that you can load something and push it onto the stack. Load const, load fast, load name, load global. Load const and load fast are, as you know, the name fast kind of implies, they're fast. Load name and load global are kind of slow. It goes back to not all Python bytecode operations are created equal. Uh, load name and load global are sort of slow because they have to do a lot of extra work, especially load global. Uh, load global source code is kind of fun to read if you, if you ever want to get an idea of how does Python actually look up a name. Uh, I'm going to have a link to where you can do that in a minute. Another thing is on the theme of some operations are expensive, Loops and blocks are expensive. They're really handy. They're really nice. They make your code really readable. They're also slower than a lot of other things. Uh, you'll see these instructions, set up loop, set up with, set up exception. These tell you you're beginning one of these blocks. And they involve more work than just executing a, a single simple bytecode instruction. They have to set up everything that's going to be happening in that loop or in that try accept block or that with block or whatever, they have to push onto the block stack. They may have to you know, deal with jump targets. You get to the end, you may have to loop back to the top. Uh, at the end, you have to clean up everything. You have to pop off the block stack. There'll be another instruction, in fact, at the end to handle that called uh, pop block for most of these, except for exceptions. Every time you see one of these in bytecode, you should wonder, do I really need this block? Do I really need this loop? Always prioritize clear readable code, but if you absolutely have to optimize the heck out and for some reason you can't use C or PyPy, this is a good place to start looking. Uh, finally, another one, how many of you have ever seen a tutorial that said don't do uh, list accesses, dictionary accesses, attribute accesses inside a loop or whatever, alias whatever attribute you want to access? Those are also relatively expensive operations. Loading an attribute is, is really expensive sometimes. Uh, dictionary lookups, a little bit less so. They keep getting faster because the, the Python team are wizards and they, they read the art of computer programming, so we don't have to, thankfully. Uh, list indexing, all of these will stick out in your bytecode. Uh, you'll see these at, uh, operations, load adder, binary subscription. Uh, you'll see these, you'll be able to tell where every one of these is happening. Usually your telltale is when you see one of these happening inside the body of a loop start wondering, is there a way I can move that outside the body of the loop? Because those are relatively expensive operations compared to a lot of other things you can do in Python bytecode. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are a couple of really good resources that I want to recommend. Uh, first of all, you can go read the documentation for the disk module. It's relatively well written. Um, like technical documentation is always kind of dry. Python's documentation is really good compared to a lot of things. And the disk module gives you a really good overview of all the bytecode operations and what they do. A couple other things I want to recommend. There's a free book on LeanPub uh, called Inside the Python Virtual Machine. If you really want to learn your way around how Python is executing your code, you should read this. Uh, it includes 
full descriptions of all the call stack, the valuation stack, block stack. These slides will be online later, by the way. I'll make sure Jeff uh, sends you all a link. Um, this will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about what goes on inside Python as it's executing your code, including really scary exotic stuff like how Python makes generators work, because that, that's kind of fun stuff. Um, another good one is Allison Captor. Uh, hopefully you've all heard of her, she's awesome. Uh, has a thing up, a Python interpreter written in Python. This walks through writing Python code to read and execute Python bytecode and handles almost everything. I think maybe it doesn't handle generators or maybe it's been updated and now it does. Handles uh, just about everything that Python bytecode can do and walks you through what all of these constructs are and shows you how to build them in Python and really get a good feel for them. And finally, here's a link to GitHub, to the official CPython repository. If you want to see the gigantic switch statement that lives in the middle of the Python interpreter and actually looks at all these bytecode operators and figures out what to do with them and how they're all implemented, that's where you can find it. So all of those are really good resources. Uh, I really recommend looking them up and reading them if you want to really understand how Python works and how Python is executing your code, because it's a useful thing to know. Uh, even if you never actually use it, just having the mental model People like to talk about C as, as sort of portable assembler, that you can reason about C code and figure out what assembly it's gonna turn into when you compile it. If you read through, at the very least, the documentation for the disk module and maybe Allison's post about how to build a bytecode interpreter, you will be able to look at your own Python code and start reasoning about this and understanding what bytecode is this gonna turn into and what is my Python interpreter really gonna be doing as my code is executing, which is a really handy skill to have. Uh, and of course, if anybody has any questions, I'm right here. I'll also be here uh, the rest of the evening. Uh, so feel free to come find me at any point. And uh, yeah, we have the microphone over there, I think. Or, oh yeah, Jeff has a microphone. Okay, so if I look at a modern a CPU guide, like say the 6502. So in the 6502, it would come back and it would say, oh, you're going to increment Y, this would take one clock cycle. You're going to do this add, this is going to take three clock cycles. Is there any sort of rough estimate, even though we know it's going to be far off saying, yeah, when I'm going to start calling this function, that's going to take about five or six or ten times more than the smallest bytecode? One. Um, so when are you going to write this? I would have to, I would have to sit down and think about it. Uh, my, my immediate answer would be go read uh, ceval.c in the Python source code, because uh, you will be able to see each one of the bytecode operations and see exactly how it's implemented. Uh, and from there, you can get a rough guess of what's going on uh, actually on your CPU as those bytecode instructions are being executed. Uh, I haven't written this. I'm not sure I will have time to, because I'm also trying to write a book right now about something completely different, but I'll keep it in the back of my mind. Yeah. I may not need a microphone. If not for optimization, why would I ever... It, it, is actually, it is actually pretty cool. Um, it is an insight into how your code really works. It is an insight into how Python really works. And there's a reason why I mentioned fourth, because uh, fourth can be kind of weird if you've never encountered it, but learning to think about stack-based programming and stack-based languages, uh, I think is a useful skill and is a useful type of sort of unusual reasoning that you don't see a lot of these days. Uh, so I think it's also going to broaden your mind a bit. Layman question. Uh, so if you were talking about, say, other languages like Ruby or Java. How would different be the talk about this? Uh, well, let's take Java as an example, because Java also compiles to bytecode. The Java compiler produces bytecode, uh, and then the Java virtual machine executes it. Except the Java virtual machine is hideously complicated, but also a really incredibly cool piece of technology. Um, the Java virtual machine does optimizations that leave everybody else in the dust and can do really cool things with your code. Uh, but it's also the sort of thing that you would need to write four or five volumes of really thick books to explain everything that's going on in there. Uh, Ruby's VM I don't know as much about.
Um, I don't know much about the design of the particular um, code operators that Python uses. I would bet there are some people in this room who might have some input on it. Uh, I'm not going to look at you, but you know, you know who you are. Uh, it is kind of interesting if you read the documentation for the disk module. A lot of those instructions have you know notes about this was added in this Python version. Looking at those notes and matching them up to what was added in that Python version or what changed and wondering, I wonder why this instruction was added. I wonder why we needed this all of a sudden. And then comparing that to the release notes of Python, uh, I think can give you some ideas. Uh, otherwise, I would defer to someone on the core Python team as to why particular choices were made. To tell you the truth, I very rarely worry about optimizing my Python code. Uh, I found that Python is plenty fast for what I do, but also most of what I do is web programming, um, mostly with Django. And there, you know, I could optimize the heck out of everything and write my applications in hand-rolled assembly and my bottleneck would still be my database. Uh, so I don't worry too much about that. I think it can be useful in evaluating different constructs and figuring out uh, what bytecode do these constructs translate into can give you ideas about what is this code going to do. It can also sometimes, like, uh, like I mentioned, if you see things like attribute access or dictionary lookups in the middle of a loop, sometimes can give you hints that you're doing something not as efficiently as you could be. Uh, but you can also learn that just from looking at the code a lot of the time. Mostly, I like bytecode as an example because it's something so different that you come to kind of fresh and it makes things stick out, where most of us are probably used to looking at Python code to the point that our eyes kind of is over and we don't always see these things. But seeing it in a very different context, like in the context of bytecode, can make things jump out at you. That can make you realize, oh, I did something that maybe wasn't the best way to write this. Uh, but again, I mostly don't worry too much about performance because I'm gonna be waiting on my database no matter what I do. It's the story of my life. Just a very quick comment. Great, great talk. I really, really liked it. Um, in Python 3.6, byte codes were actually turned into word codes. So instead of 8-bit uh, codes, we now have 16-bit word codes, uh, which allows for some optimization in the C eval loop. So. Also, yeah. Well, Anybody else? I think we probably should move on also. Thanks a lot. It was a great talk. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Daniel Pyrathon, and today I'll be presenting a practical guide to SVD. Bear in mind, this talk is totally a work in progress, and hopefully by the time I get to PyCon, it'll be a lot better. Uh, but anyway, feedback is very, very open. And so let me start by asking two questions. First question, who binge watches Netflix here? Yeah, lift up your hand. All right, why is Netflix so addictive? Let me ask you another question. How did Spotify found out that you have a secret love for Taylor Swift? You thought you wanted to hide it, but you know, unfortunately Spotify found out. Some people say Spotify knows them better than their significant other, and I believe it. There's a really funny tweet that I found while um, building this talk, which says, quote unquote, at this point, Spotify's Discover Weekly knows me so well that if it proposed, I'd say yes. <laughs> I, I kind of agree. <laughs> um, so what is that magic ingredient that makes these services like, like Netflix and like Spotify so personal? Recommendations. 
hopefully by the end of this talk, you will find out what recommendations are. So let me tell you why I'm here. So I work for this online dating company called Coffee Meets Bagel. Who knows Coffee Meets Bagel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, thank you. <laughs> if the dates are bad, please don't blame me, okay? But <laughs> yeah, so uh, I recently moved from a, from a traditional sort of uh, software engineering role uh, back in an infrastructure to uh, sort of more of the uh, algorithm component. Most importantly, I actually have barely no scientific background. And I know what you guys are thinking now, that's a terrible idea. But uh, it turns out that Python has this sort of wonderful property of being really, really simple that allowed me to, to learn some of the concepts behind recommendation engines really, really in a, in a simple way. And hopefully but today, this is what I'm trying to transmit to you. Today, we're going to be covering two main, component, uh, two main parts. The first part is the theory. So we're going to understand what our recommendation, what, what is a recommendation engine, and we're going to go through uh, one way of building recommendations, which is called collaborative filtering. At the end of this first part, you're going to understand how to build recommendations with a simple library called Surprise. And if you're still there after this first part and you haven't left, well, then we'll get to the second part, which is sort of reverse engineering how Surprise works and actually under, trying to understand in a, in a Pythonic way some of the, the science behind, behind the SVD. So without further ado, what is a recommendation engine? Probably the, the best way to understand a recommendation engine is think of it as your own very personal search engine, right? Not only it's, it's, it provides search results that are good for you, for you personally, but also it improves over time, right? And if you look at the picture here on the right, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Anyone? Amazon, right? Amazon is the perfect experience of, uh, the perfect example of recommendation engine, and also the perfect example of how you waste a lot of money on things that you don't really need, but Amazon tells you you need them, right? And, uh, and the thing about Amazon is that it sort of understands, it has these recommendation engines that understand the way, the way you, you behave and the products that you buy, and based on those, it suggests other new products, right? What are the benefits of a recommendation engine? Well, there are many, but let me tell you a few. The first thing is that uh, recommendation engines really increase the, uh, the, uh, the, the engagement of, of your users on like your, your blog or your application. But it's also another great benefit compared to a traditional search engine is that it increases the coverage of the items that you exposed on your platform, right? And, and by, by increasing the coverage of, of, of the, the products that you expose, you really provide this sort of sense of discovering. Right, and you build new connections that were not already there. And hopefully this is already enough to get you excited, but let me point out some facts here. Why are these recommendation engines so important? 35% of Amazon's revenue is actually generated by recommendation engine. That is quite a lot of money. <laughs> and everyone's, everyone's guilty for buying things they shouldn't have, and uh, that's, you should blame recommendation engines for that. Um, all right, so recommendation engine is a very, very generic concept. There are, there are many sort of implementations of them, but today I want to focus on one specific, which is called collaborative filtering, right? Who's ever heard of collaborative filtering here? All right, great. Uh, you probably know more than me, by the way. <laughs> uh, so collaborative filtering is, is this way to analyze users' interactions with products, right? Interestingly, compared to other uh, ways of providing recommendations, the collaborative filtering doesn't necessarily know anything about the user itself or the product. What it simply knows are the interactions between users of products. And when, it, when I mean the, the like, actually doesn't know anything, let's just take, for example, uh, Netflix, right? So Netflix serves uh, movies, right? And what I mean by the attributes of movies, you can think of like the genre, or the length of the movie, or the director, maybe? Well, collaborative filtering doesn't really care about that. It only cares about 
which user interacts with what product. And basically what it does is it pretty much favors this concept of, uh, this, this beautiful concept of algorithmic discovery through past experiences, right? We all contribute to the, the, the future experiences of other people similar to us. And collaborative filtering has, is the, the, the main sort of free ingredients, the main free components of collaborative filtering are users, products, and ratings. What are, well, users are pretty much sort of uh, the, the, the actors in your, your application, right? We're all users of some, uh, of some application like Netflix or Amazon. The products are a lot more sort of uh, domain specific. In the case of Amazon, it could be books. In the case of Netflix, it could be movies, right? In the case of Spotify, it could be songs. The ratings are a sort of a, a quantifiable number, a way to quantify how good an interaction was between a user and a product. And this may happen explicitly or implicitly. Let's, let's take an example. If I go on Amazon and I have, I think it's a rating between one to five, or something similar to that. Well, it's like one to five stars. That is an example of an explicit rating. You're literally telling Amazon that you're rating this product four out of five. But they're also implicit. Like for example, Spotify suggests you a track and you skip early, something like that. Well, that is also considered a implicit rating, right? Today, we're gonna to be speaking about one main algorithm that is used to provide collaborative filtering. It's called SVD, right? And what SVD is, is this, uh, it's a very, very famous algorithm and it's, it's very sort of well understood. It works by performing something called matrix factorization, which pretty much sort of reduces the dimensionality of your data, sorry, reduces the dimensionality of your data. And, and, and by doing that, it approximates, it's able to sort of interpret new results. It's also very famous because it won the Netflix prize. I don't know if anyone knows about this prize. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. And uh, the, the actual uh, winner of the Netflix prize used a variant of, of SVD. But, you know, this is all, I, I, wanna, I wanna go into, I wanna sort of show you step by step how, how, how SVD actually works, right? How do we use SVD to predict new matches? Right, I think it's a, the, the best way to understand this is a three-step process, right? The first part of the process is you need to have some ratings, right? Just think of this as a pandas data set. It has three columns, a user ID, a product ID, and a rating, right? We take these ratings and, and we, we fit the SVD with it, right? Bear in mind, this is all pseudocode, but I, the, my plan here is to try to get the message across. By fitting the ratings, what we're doing here is we're allowing SVD to sort of understand what's happening under the hood. Once the fitting happens, then we have our, our, trained, our trained SVD and we can, we can call predict on any new user and any new product to find the, the score, right? So Python has this really, really good implementation. There are many SVD implementations in, in Python. For example, I think SciPy ha also has one. But uh, today I wanna talk to you about this, this library called Surprise. It's, it's a really, really simple library to, to start and, and learn how to use recommenders. It's a library that I started to understand and it really helped me understand. Um, it's, it's not only very, very simple to sort of get started, but it's also got a lot of batteries included. It provides SVD algorithms, but also many others like SVD++, non-negative matrix factorization. And it's also got a lot of tools to sort of load data sets and explore them. It's uh, obviously open source, you can install it with PIP. And uh, it's got a very, very simple interface similar to scikit-learn, which many people probably know about. And the author is this, this person called Nicolas Hug, which I, met randomly on by email now, so we'll become friends. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he's very, very passionate. He's very good maintainer of the project. Yeah. And I just wanna show some code of how simple it is with Surprise to actually start serving recommendations. I have highlighted four steps here. The first step is defining the data set, right? 
So we want to have our data set of three columns here, the user ID, the product ID, and the rating. The second step here is we need to define the, the domain of our ratings, right? Remember, a rating is, is a very, very domain specific, right? Every application will have its different sort of rating of domain. So what we need to do is we need to say the smallest, what is the, the smallest rating we have in our system and the biggest rating. And then we, we, we instantiate a new data set here. And a data set is simply a, uh, a component that is provided by surprise to uh, load the data and sort of index it in an efficient way. On step three, we train the model. And as you can see, it's very, very simple. All you have to do is just call dot fit with a data set. And then finally, you have your trained classifier. So you can predict new matches. So by now, you already know how to use the library. You can go back and use Surprise in your, in your side project and in your, maybe in your company, right? But if you're still awake by now, which is a good sign, all right, I want to go down the rabbit hole, okay? Let's undercover some of the magic behind SVD, right? Who's ready to go down the rabbit hole? Yay, all right, great. All right, so let's go back to this concept of users and products, okay? Just think of this as a, uh, a graph of interactions, right? Here we have our three users and our four products, right? User one interacts, uh, has some level of interaction with an orange, a apple, and a banana, right? What other ways do we have to actually represent a graph? We could get this interaction graph and pretty much create this user to product matrix, right? And as you can see, every row here identifies a user and every column identifies a product. And every cell is the interaction between a user, is the rating that the user gives to a specific product, right? And what does our recommendation engine actually try to figure out? It tries to figure out all the other interactions that we've never seen, right? If we, never, if we didn't have any question marks, then there'd be no point in having a recommender, right? So what we need to figure out are how do we actually identify these, uh, these new results? Well, let's just, take, let's just take this matrix and let's just set it aside for a second, okay? I, I apologize for the change in color. This is still a work in progress. Uh, <laughs> let's just take this user of product matrix, right? It turns out, how, how do we find out these question marks that we have here? It turns out that there is this technique called matrix factorization. What does matrix factorization actually do? It takes one big matrix and it decomposes it into two smaller matrices. And it is a dimensionality reduction technique. It's used to pretty much extract information from the main matrix and sort of compress it into two smaller matrices. SVD, which is the algorithm that I was speaking about earlier, is the algorithm that performs matrix factorization. Let's take a look. Here are the two matrices. As you can see, there is a user matrix and there is a products matrix. The user's matrix has our free users and has these two latent features, right? The product matrix has the R4 products and these, again, two latent features. What are these latent features? Well, SVD is an algorithm that needs to be called with uh, two parameters. One is the matrix, and the other one is something called a rank. What is a rank? A rank is a, is a positive integer that identifies how much information we want to extract from this matrix. The, more, the, the, the higher the rank, the more information we extract. Obviously, the higher the rank, the bigger the, uh, the, the associated matrix are, right? The more, higher the rank, the more information. Here, so can someone guess what our rank is? Anyone? Two. Perfect. As you can see, we only have two latent features. If we, we, uh, we, call, if we performed an SVD with a rank of 10, we would have, our matrices would have 10 latent features instead of two. So, what I want to do now is I want to explain some of the properties of these latent features, right? These latent features uh, are 
I think they're very hard to explain, but I want to try and as simple as possible to try and interpret what they are. They are the DNA of our users and our product. Every user and every product in our system has these, let's call them hidden features, right? They're features that we are not able to actually identify as something observable, but they are features that identify those users. And these latent features have two main properties that I want to focus on. The first property is that between items and between users, they can be compared. So how can we find if two users are similar between them? We, all we do have to do is perform some kind of similarity metric. In this case, we're using cosine similarity. We just compare the, the, two, the, the two vectors of the two products. The score, the higher the score, the, the more similar these, uh, these users will be. And another thing we can do is actually compute scores, generate new predictions for, for users and items that, that have not been seen yet. So if I have a new user vector and a product vector, I, if I, and I perform the dot product, what I'm basically doing is I'm generating the predicted rating. Now is the time where I have not prepared anything, and so we're going to go into <laughs> complete uh, ambiguity. Uh, let's let's try. It. Okay, so let's start with this one. Okay, so I I, I kind of uh, set up a few things here. Uh, I want to actually go show you a demo of surprise, and the probably the best way to start is here. Uh, I've loaded a data set of MovieLens. I don't know who's ever used MovieLens. It's a very, very uh, famous sort of open source data set of users and movies, users seeing movies, and uh, users rating movies. So as you can see here, we have this, this table called ratings data, and it has four columns, the user ID, the movie ID, and the rating. The rating contains the interactions between the users and these movies. And this is where we basically take the data set of ratings and we run it through the SVD. I want to go through step, step by step what's happening here. So obviously we're importing SVD here from Surprise. And we define a reader here, which, as I said, pretty much specifies the domain of our ratings. In this case, MovieLens specifies a rating from 1 to 5. And then we call this data set load from data frame, and we give the free, we only take, we only extract the free columns here, the user ID, the movie ID, and the rating. And we pass in the reader, which specifies the ratings. Over here, we're we're creating a new SVD, and we're specifying that we want 100 factors. So this is a rank of 100, right? And as soon as that is trained, here we're just simply performing some validation. And what we do here is we, we're, in, we're going to inspect this matrix. So these are all the latent features that we've generated. I've just, I just printed the first 10, right? Every row here is a movie. And these are the features. This is the DNA of every movie. Interestingly, what Surprise does is it only generates recommendations. It only indexes movies that it has enough information of, because if not, it's not able to perform matrix factorization accurately. And what I want to do here is simply just show you how simple the predict operation is. We can call predict with a user and a movie. In this case, movie one is Toy Story, which is one of my favorite. And yeah, people really like Toy Story. This, this random user really likes Toy Story. Yeah. And uh, sorry, to go back to my slides, I promise these are going to be better for Python. <laughs> um, yeah. In conclusion, I, I, I really encourage people to uh, Explore Surprise. This is a really, really interesting library. It's very simple for you to just simply go home, get a data set, or use the ones loaded by Surprise, and play around with the algorithms yourself. Interestingly, the barrier of entry for this kind of thing is very, very low, thanks to Python. And 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully this wasn't that terrible. Uh. Any questions? I found it. So, okay, you showed how to do a fit between people and products. And the obvious question I have is, okay, so you're working for a data, dating site. Do you do something similar where you're mapping people to people? That, that, is, that, is, well, that is correct. It's very terrible to call people products. But <laughs> <laughs> it's very terrible. But uh, yeah, obviously what, uh, you know, in, in this case, for example, we were recommending users to other users, so yes. Do, do you follow, do you basically follow the, the main idea that you present here where um, it's pretty similar? Like you, like for example, when, you, when you're um, predicting latent features for a person, what, what number do you use? Do you use like 10 or 100 or? We use, we use, we use 100. 100 is a good number. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, do you have any of that code available, or is that more sort of like, uh, <laughs> is that, I mean, well, obviously there's an, I could probably reverse engineer it based on what I've seen here. Uh, is there anything special that you do that you're willing to share? Yeah, yeah, sure. So probably the only thing that, uh, that we do is, so uh, what, what I wanted to show here about actually generating these latent features and using the matrix directly instead of using the predict API is that we can, you know, re reconstructing like recommendations for every user is, is very, very expensive, both from a memory perspective and a computation perspective. So what we, the only thing that we really do is we sort of index these vectors in different buckets depending on uh, region. Luckily, dating is a, is a regional problem, right? You wouldn't, you don't want to date someone from New York if you're in San Francisco. So uh, what we simply do is we put these in buckets. And when we perform the actual, when we try to reconstruct the scores, we minimize the amount of vectors we're actually moving around. Uh, another question, is it comparable to um, linear regression in that when you build a linear regression model, you get what I call weights. Mm -hmm. And yes. you can look at the, the, val the, the size of the weights and say, oh, that weight carries a lot of weight and that one doesn't. Can you do the same thing with these, these latent features where a, a latent feature has a largest value? You can say, oh, that's an important one, and then another one is near zero, and you can say that's not important? Yes, that, that, is, uh, that, is, that is really true. So these latent features, uh, again, they're, 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 we call them hidden features, but they do have some kind of you know, real-world correlation, right? An example is a, a, very, a very important feature. I mean, this is not like a surprise. Is if for us, is attractiveness, right? If, uh, if a user is attractive, that is a huge, that, that comes out as a latent feature. We don't know that it's specifically that, but we know that this feature is more important than others. And in fact, sometimes what we actually do is we cut out some of the latent features, specifically to increase the pool of recommendations and to avoid being skewed in like biases. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. All right. It's still on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, something brought up previously. You talked about latent features as sort of static. Is there a reciprocity since you're doing a dating site? Can a latent feature be based on how much somebody likes you? So if you like the product and the product likes you back, does that increase? <laughs> uh, Likelihood of a recommendation, that sort of thing? So, so what, you're, what you're saying is re receiving the feedback? Or? Yeah, can there be some sort of feedback mechanism where you have to have two things select each other, as opposed to me selecting a movie, the movie doesn't care how much I like it. Uh, can you provide an example? Uh, sure, so you're talking about dating. Yeah. The likelihood of a good match is based on how much maybe the other person likes me back. Yes, that's correct. So how do you take that into effect? Oh, okay, now I understand. So, so what, we, what we can do is you can actually generate uh, a complex models where like one section of latent features then feeds into another section of latent features. That's actually a model that we're exploring where what we do is we generate features 
from, for example, male towards female, and then we generate other features from female towards male. So and the then we kind of concatenate are... them together. We build a network that concatenates them together. So it's a model feeding into a model feeding. That's correct. Model. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I have a couple of questions. The first question is, how do you deal with the inherent uh, inaccuracy of a rating system? Say, for example, I can rate you a four on five and somebody can rate you a two on five. So there's no set criteria for uh, giving ratings. And my second question is, I did something similar uh, with the movie lens data set and for uh, items wherein there was no history. Basically, Surprise has filtered those things because it can't do matrix factorization. What I did was based on other uh, attributes like genre, director and all those stuff, I computed similarity scores fundamentally. So what else would you do? Assuming that you don't have all those information, how do you deal with these two things to come up with a model that is good? good yeah, that, that, that's those are two really good questions. So let me answer them. Um, let me let me start. Let me start by by answering the last question. Uh, the last question was basically how do you deal with with information of, with with users or products that you do not have too much information on, and the way the way you deal with that is uh, or I would personally just cut them out. Like if you if you have if you have, this is the cold start problem. I don't know if you ever, if anyone's ever heard of the cold start problem. When users, this is the problem of recommenders, when users onboard your application, you do not have that much information about them, right? About their interaction with the products. So what I would really suggest is, is cut them out of, of, of entirety of your rating set. Because what they would do is they will, they will make your matrix factorization model, your SVD, sort of generalize on top of that, where really what you want to have in your SVD model are users and products that the application has a lot of experience with, right? And then, sorry, the, the first question was, sorry, ter terrible memory. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah, thanks. So I don't know if you saw my, my previous, uh, in my slides at the bottom it says, I'm actually ignoring the bias. I'm actually ignoring the, the, the bias factor. So uh, what Surprise does, the uh, SVD implementation of Surprise, is it actually creates something called a bias factor, which pretty much tries to avoid this problem. There are some users, for example, especially in a dating application, again, this is not a secret, that males that just go like, 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 right? And females that go pass, 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 pass. <laughs> right? So, so uh, what, what, what Surprise will do for us is it'll pretty much create uh, one one variable which is called the the bias, right? Where this bias pretty much sort of absorbs the uh, the the bias of the user, or of like you know being too much of a hater or a liker in this case. We yeah we extract those and we dump them, yeah, because we don't like biases. So. You, you described the algorithm as sort of a matrix factorization, um, but there's a there's a bunch of cap, uh, cells that have no data, right? There's a question yes. mark. Do you know what how conceptually, mathematically, how it fills in, or you know what is it used yes. for that? Yes. So what what actually happens? So the way matrix factorization works is we have this big matrix that's called A, and we factoring out a matrix A into B and C, right? So that then we can get B and C and multiply them back together and reconstruct the original matrix. So the, the, this idea of sort of reducing the dimensionality is actually interesting because when we, when we compute the original matrix again, what we're effectively doing is we're generalizing and we are filling in those numbers that were not filled in before. Don't know if that makes sense. Uh, it just seems like uh, mathematically, you know, normally when you deal with matrices, you always have to have numbers in them. Like yeah. some trick that you do. Oh, oh so you're saying so? So the, you, you can you can set a default number, which is which could be zero, or it really depends. So and, and and that goes into another concept, which is called uh, implicit and explicit matrix factorization. So uh, in the for example, in in our space, in the dating application space you necessarily have to pass or like on a user, right? There's no way of like saying, I don't want to have an opinion. And so we always have a number. But if you're, for example, Amazon, 
and you have a lot of products. The fact that you don't purchase a product doesn't necessarily mean you don't like the product, right? And so what, for example, uh, Amazon would perform potentially is a uh, implicit matrix factorization, which uh, sort of fills in fills in the empty cells with something like like average average rating per user or average rating per product. The what sorry? Oh yeah, yeah, mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I know that you uh, wear the hat of a software engineer and a machine learning uh, scientist. Uh, quick question, how do you scale your application when it comes to data science? Uh, yeah. Say, this is a very small project, let's say that you are... That is a that is an excellent, excellent question, because uh, especially as our the application grows, you're basically not able to fit the entire matrix into memory. And in fact, that's why I really like Surprise, because it's really, really easy to play around with and to understand the, comp the concept. And so that then when your application grows, you're, you're prepared to literally use something else. So what we use is we use Spark's ALS implementation, uh, and, and that allows us to sort of scale out. And the good thing is that Spark also has, a, has PySpark, which is very, very simple. And the API is very, very similar. So pretty much, Learn. You can learn with surprise, and then uh, use Spark if your if your infrastructure grows. And uh, another thing I wanted to say. So actually, uh, me and my colleague did a talk at uh, AWS reInvent, and uh, we we basically explained how we scale out recommendations. So if you're in, it, it's a very sort of long long thing, but you can you can go look it up, and we are, we have a talk there. So uh, you have any numbers on the response time, the turnaround time? That you have. Yes. Yeah. Right so, there. so I could say, and the good thing about Spark is that it's pretty much scalable horizontally, and it's it scales pretty much linearly based on the the you know your load, and um, and what what we usually have is uh, in our company we have a twenty four hour turnaround. So, for example, new users that onboard your application after twenty four hours already have recommendation engines that kick in and provide recommendations for them. Okay, so you do a batch processing. That's correct. We do we do some we do both batch processing and we also use real time to fill in. We we provide sort of global search queries that sort of global search engine that I was speaking about previously to solve the cold start problem. Question, then we better move on. Uh, I think this yeah. Um, so usually when you uh, go to a website and you see these ratings. Um, most people just sort of assume that that rating is you're doing a favor for the other people uh, who are in the uh, uh, who are using the website. But it, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, that rating data is actually uh, important in fleshing out your matrix in order to make your uh, predictions more accurate, right? So what you're basically saying is that users intentionally go on the product because they're like friends of other of other users. Is is that what you're? No, and, uh, um, I made the assumption before this evening that the only reason that you have ratings on these sites is that you're doing favors for other people at the site by giving the thing the thing a rating. And I wanted to make sure that I got that I got this correct that uh, that rating actually does a dual purpose. And uh, its other purpose is to help flesh out the, the mathematical matrices in order to make the predictions more accurate. Yes, yes. Okay, that means I understood you. Thank you. I'm happy to. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, great talk. Okay, so I have a question for you. I'm covering how to download and install packages uh, but I'm also covering how to create uh, packages and post them online. A uh, show of hands, who is just interested in uh, downloading and installing? Show of hands? Okay, uh, so everybody here is interested in also uh, creating and posting packages online. Okay, this is good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So the whole point of packaging as we're talking about, is to give your code to somebody else. Now, there's a hard way 
hard way for the recipient is that you throw the files over the cube wall and say, whoops, time for lunch. <laughs> or some other excuse. Oh, my uh, goldfish is sick. It's been awfully thirsty lately. Okay, uh, so there's no README or instructions that comes with the code. No idea if other libraries are re required and what versions of those libraries. Now, the other way to do it, uh, which I recommend, is the easy way for the recipient. Uh, you give them one file, contains everything. Uh, the file type is widely known, uh, and the methods for using the file to install a code, you know, the code are uh, uh, well known, and all information is there. And that's what we call packaging. Okay, now, there are some things that packaging packages are not. So a package, again, is a file that transports code. Uh, it's called a wheel file nowadays. Uh, it is not the same thing as a, a Python script. Now, a package can contain Python script, but it's not the same. And it's also not an executable. Um, you note both those programs are written in Python and, and then uh, compiled, but you're not installing the Python. You're just downloading and installing the uh, the, the client. Okay, now there's other things that, that are called packages. So what we're talking about here is a distribution package. We're, you know, we're distributing uh, our product. That's what we want. Uh, it's not an import package. That's the uh, uh, Python concept. The package is a, a collection of modules. It's not a Linux distro package, although you can use Linux distro packages to install programs made from Python. And, and then on top of that, there's two types of distribution packages, the source code or binaries without source. And that's called a built distribution. So I'm gonna go very quickly through a, a, sort of a quick history of Python packaging. Uh, in the beginning, there were no distribution packages. You had to use the hard way. So you had to know the Python directory structure and uh, I figured it was, would be valuable to go through that right now in case it is ever useful to you. Um, and this uh, structure I'm showing you is good for uh, Python 2 and 3. So on Windows, um, so there's two, uh, the first two rows are uh, the essential executables and PIP is the, uh, the program used for uh, installing uh, packages. And there's also two essential folders, uh, the Python standard library and the, and the packages that you install. Now, I have a uh, environment variable there, uh, home, and this is its value. And the value depends on who installs the package uh, who, who installs uh, Python, and also whether it's a 32 or 64-bit program. And uh, uh, this example it was done with Python 3.6. So you'll see a 3 and a 3.6. This is applicable to any Python version. Also, uh, if you note, all, all the paths that are directories end with a slash or backslash. And Linux and OS X, it's pretty similar. Um, there are situations where instead of putting in a lib directory, it puts in a lib64 directory. That's what CentOS did to me. Um, but uh, for Linux, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Debian-based uh, uh, distros, they like to do, uh, do it a little differently. So you see that dist is underlined, and that's a little different than site packages. So that's the difference there. And again, there's a home environment variable that takes on a value depending on what, what operating system you're, you're dealing with. Now, the Debian-based Linux distros also have another uh, variable that is not present elsewhere. So depending on who installs it, uh, uh, it could go in one of three different places. And again, this is 3.6, good for all versions. And, and finally, with the old way, there are two environment variables. 
um, their Python path and Python home. Uh, Python path, I'm sure you're familiar with, Python home is optional. But uh, in, in those days, everything was done by hand. You had to construct Python path. You had to switch it when you switched between uh, projects. Uh, so there was no such thing as a, a virtual environment. You had to determine the dependencies amongst mo modules, and you had to find and change, uh, track changes to third-party modules and handle versioning. Now, packaging does all that for you. If you're missing a library, it'll automatically download and install it. And that in itself is an achievement because originally it wasn't set up that way. It also checks the version number. Uh, there's uh, uh, metadata embedded in the uh, uh, distribution file, like you know who, who wrote it. And uh, there is now a central maintained package store, a Python package index. Uh, that's the part that half of the automatic downloading and installing of required packages. Now packaging was a mess for a while, so it was delegated, it's been delegated to the so-called Python Packaging Authority. Uh, that's their URL. And this is their user guide. So this is the go-to, the first go-to if you have questions about uh, the packaging. Another resource, which I consider official because it was delivered at PyCon recently, is this. And um, you do not have to photograph this since I'm going to, uh, at the last slide, I'm going to put the GitHub directory URL where I put this. This is a, a so this is going to be posted up there, but photograph it now if you'd like it. And just as a warning, there is obsolete information all over. There's been so many changes and additions to packaging that it's, it's, uh, it's very confusing. That's partly why I took on this topic, so I, so I could figure it out. So packaging today, use uh, pip. Uh, used to be easy install, which is still installed with Python, so we, uh, pip is recommended. The distribution media is a wheel file. Eggs are the old format. There's a, a low, lower level library called setup tools. And then there's a program setup.py, which is your interface uh, for, uh, for organizing and constructing the package. And we'll get, it, get to that in a bit. And there is another library out there, an older one called distutils, and it's being, uh, it's ba basically it's being uh, uh, obsoleted. Now, in addition to all the other varieties, there are three types of wheels. There's a universal one, which uh, is Python for both versions, pure Python, which is two or three, but not both. And that might be a little confusing because pure Python is a phrase used uh, elsewhere to, to simply uh, denotes a package that only has Python in it. So there's a little bit of ambiguity there you should be aware of. And then there's a platform uh, package, uh, which is an extension written in C. If you happen to need to diddle with Python uh, path, use sys.path instead. Uh, from the good old uh, sys library, uh, constructs the path for you, and it's an uh, uh, elegant uh, algorithm, and you can read the uh, site module docs for that. Now pip, here's, here's the, uh, the, uh, the reference for it. If you want to use it, first you have to make sure it's installed. If it's not installed, you use this command. Uh, and that pulls it out of the standard library and installs it for you. And then if you want to download the latest version of a particular project, there's that simple command. So behind the, uh, behind the curtain, it is actually going to the Python package index and uh, downloading it from there. So it takes care of all that uh, gruesome uh, details for you. You can install a specific uh, version of your package. Uh, you can upgrade it. Uh, you could uh, install it from a URL uh, that's not official. You can install it from disk. 
you could download it without installing, and you could uninstall it. If you want to see all the uh, uh, list installed packages, you use uh, pip list. Does not include the standard library, only what you have added. Uh, each uh, project comes with it a, some metadata, and that will show it to you. You know, like who made it, um, and how to contact them, and you can search the Python packet index, index for any string that you desire. If you're hunting for something you don't, don't quite know what it is, and finally, you could uh, uh, instead of doing one. Um, package at a time, you can bundle them up all together into one file. Oh, and generate a file. Okay, now virtual environments. Who here happens to uh, use a, uh, a virtual environment? Okay, it's interesting because I, I do not. I use PyDev to uh, handle multiple projects. Uh, suppose, well, here's a motivation for virtual environments. Probably all of you already know this, but Suppose you have a working project with a module that's defined globally, not locally. You add a new project and it calls it and wants to access an incompatible version of that same module. And now you have just broken the first project. So virtual environments simply completely isolate projects from each other. Each project has its own directory structure. Um, and uh, so there's two uh, popular virtual environments. The f original one is virtual ENV. Um, and if you want more information about it, uh, there it is. The second one, VENV, is the current one. It's actually in the Python standard library. And it will not work for Python 2. You can go there if you want more information about it. And then if you want to use uh, multiple versions of Py, Python, you use PyEnv. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, we're not doing virtual environments. I'm just assuming we are staying with one project. Okay, so in order to create a package, first you have to lay out a bunch of files in a directory. And um, this is not doesn't have to be the same layout of the uh, uh, that you use in your IDE. You, you know, there is that distinction. Um, you'll notice that there are some places, uh, some places that are italicized. Um, so those are more placeholders. So a package name, uh, that's a placeholder for the actual pa pa package name. And uh, core code and helper code is just what you might do to divide up the code to make it uh, a little more uh, handleable. You want to put all your uh, core code into a single file. Uh, you could actually put it in the, uh, in the directory tree and skip the, uh, the package directory. So then there's test code. Uh, make sure that uh, you can customize the package and, and test it to see if you broke it. There's a data file that you could put in if you need, um, perhaps test or sample data. Um, there's a license, you know, the open source license. There's two URLs that are handy for uh, picking which one you want. Um, and here's a manifest file, and it's required in order to uh, include non-coding into your non-coding files into your package. And here's a, an example of it. And actually explicitly lists all the uh, uh, files you want to put in. There's the usual README, uh, the, uh, the project's goal, how to run it, blah, blah. Uh, there's a setup.py, which we, which we alluded to before. And that is the master command line program that does the packaging for you. Uh, it's simple. It con contains a call to a, a function named setup. And it has name value pairs. It gives all the information about the package and includes things like dependencies. And then this file is used by setup.py in doing its work. Now you can have other files in the project root. Um, you now uh, the, you know, it's your choice. It's your package. You can put in whatever you want. 
uh, to create a package, you, of course, you, you can cre create the directory tree, or there's a very handy package out there called Cookie Cutter, which you can use to generate for you. Uh, so, so you uh, dr uh, create the directory tree, add the source code and the tests, customize the non-code files, and then run your test. And assuming you want to post it, say, on GitHub, GitHub or Bitbucket, you create the client repository and push it up. Then you'll want to create a, an account on the Python packaging index, if, uh, since you know, you're going to be posting it there for anybody out there to download. And here's a practice URL that you could uh, practice on uh, to reduce the impact on uh, production. Uh, you can save the settings for the account to this file, but don't put it in your package because it has your login. Now, to create the package, check if the wheel package is installed. Um, install the package called Twine, which uploads to uh, PyPy, and then you make your desired package. And drink time. So the first type that you can make is a source distribution. So it uses the uh, sdist keyword. You want to create a, a wheel, you use that, uh, uh, that uh, keyword. So you can make a binary package, and what that means is that on Windows, it's an executable, and on Linux, it's a RPM or whatever. And there's an open question that I couldn't resolve on my own. Maybe you could look it up. Some of these uh, uh, delivery methods include the Python library, the Python executable in there. Some of them do not, and in those cases, you have to have uh, Python uh, installed externally. You can upload it, uh, the uh, uh, package. Um, it's going to be in a, a, a directory called dist, which is created for you if it's not already uh, there. And then test it to make sure that everything works. Try to download and install it. And uh, you can post documentation on that website if you'd like. So it really is, uh, it does, it's doing a lot of stuff for you. And, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of detail work, you know, consulting references on how to do specific things in your packaging. Now there's another um, thing you could do. You can uh, make executables with a, pat, with a uh, uh, called freezing, the freezing process. Um, so. It's uh, pretty similar to what you've, uh, uh, other stuff I've showed before. Um, here's some of the more popular freezing utilities and all the executables contain a Python interpreter. You don't need to install one. And here is uh, the home site for freezing utilities or uh, distribution utilities. Now, I've been saying Python. Um, which always uh, means C Python. Now, what if you're using a different type? So, Iron Python, you can use uh, pip. So, you can do that in Anaconda and Jython. You, you can actually download from pip uh, and install it and run it. Um, but there's also other interfaces instead of pip. You have JIP for Jython, Conda for Anaconda, and if you want to know when to use which program, consult the references. So commercial interruption, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> okay, so um, breaking for, uh, to questions. Yes. So if, <clears throat> In time past, I would make a GitHub repository and just push code to it. Would you recommend using the framework that you pointed to from Pi Pi or Pi PA uh, as a as a as a beginning skeleton to make projects? You know, to, to sort of uh, to be a disciplined 
developer. Not that I'll ever publish it to PyPy or you know prepare it for the world, but just by way of, of starting out with a a sort of acceptable common structure. So if I send my URL to someone else, they they instantly get you know what's what rather than my usual spaghetti code. You know things all over the place. That's an excellent question. The two uh, websites we're talking about, uh, the Python package index, is is designed more for uh, uh, more uh, non uh, techies to uh, download, install. Um, GitHub uh, kind kinds of places are uh, are more for uh, developers, um, and you could. Uh, pull on into your own uh, direct, uh, uh, computer. It's partly a matter of taste. Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I had two questions for you. The first one was related to Conda. I really appreciate you mentioning it. Do you know exactly how it works under the hood? You know, I, I know it uses its own like repository system, but what actually is it downloading and and how does that actually work? That's the first question. Second question is, do you uh, do you know the good best practices to install packages, for example, in edit mode? Um, so let's do the second one first. I encountered uh, references to edit mode, and I couldn't figure it out in time to do this presentation. But uh, that is a mode of using an installed uh, uh, hunk of code. Uh, and it allows you to edit the code uh, uh, without destroying the installation. Normally, you can't do that. The first question was again, oh, so what do, uh, do Pip and Conda uh, do behind the scenes? Okay. Um, as I understand it, it starts with the library uh, or package name that you give it. It goes to these websites and searches an index that lists uh, these uh, packages, goes to the specific URI for that package, and then downloads it onto your computer, and then installs it into your install uh, uh, the site packages or disk packages uh, directory. So it just basically unzips the package there? Yes, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, OK. Um, thank you for uh, calling my attention to that. Uh, other questions? Yes. So a comment on the Conda. Uh, it's not a Conda, it's a Yeah. environment, you have to uh, execute a few com commands on the command line to switch to another environment. So you have to, you have to switch to the environment first. Yes. Then the there is no, no way to use a command that says hit environment X. There is, there is a utility called pip env, which supposedly combines the two, is very new. Um, if you want to learn about that one, it might allow you to shortcut it. Okay. Yes. Uh, this might be a newbie question. I'm newbie for Python. Just I how, hear you. sorry, I'm saying uh, this might be a newbie question. Just how does the uh, package install resolve nested dependencies? For example, your package you are installing has other dependence might be either a Python package or something else. So let's say you install this package, and how does that resolve those dependencies? I'm missing pieces of what you said. Can you uh, come closer to the mic? Yeah, yeah, sorry. All right, gotcha, gotcha. So I say, how does uh, PAPE uh, resolve the nested dependencies? 
say you have a package which depending on like 20 other Python packages and they also depend on other Python packages. When you install that, how do they resolve this? Um, if you're using the Python package index, it does all of that for you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right, thanks. That's part of why it's so powerful and useful. Is it, well, it, it, yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So it's basically locked, right? You won't have any other issues. So I free them. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. For correcting me. I appreciate that. Uh, other questions? Oh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to take a second. Thank you for the talk. I uh, wanted to add a couple of quick things that people in this room may be interested in. One is the Python package index is undergoing a rebuild and redesign. You can join the beta testing at pypi.org. The other is if you use pip and if you use a Mac, please, please, please upgrade to the latest version of pip. Do pip install pip dash dash upgrade. Do it right now. Pip will stop working for you in a few months if you don't do it because the Python package index is changing its minimum TLS supported version for secure connections and Mac OS won't support that unless you use the latest pip.